Hello and welcome to another stats review video. So let's take a look at a couple of these questions, all of which will sort of model things that you might see on the open-ended part of your final exam. All right, lids are a big time business. Yes, they are. The profit, profit margins are slim, but the satisfaction that comes from making a perfectly sized lid is immeasurable. Imagine you run a lid manufacturing business living the dream and you just ordered a brand new state-of-the-art lid manufacturing machine despite your giddiness to get the machine up and running you sit down to do some planning i mean we all know what happens to the careless lid maker right anyway i probably don't need to tell you this but a standard medium-sized lid cup is eight centimeters across for a lid to not come loose during a typical beverage experience its size cannot exceed 8.4 centimeters since oversized lids are the kiss of death in this industry, you decide to set the machine to attain an, attain an average of 7.8 centimeters. You believe the outputs can be described by a normal model with a standard deviation of 0.2 centimeters. So you might be asking yourself, what's the point of all these sentences up here? Just background info. You know, I think it just makes the, pro the problem more exciting. Um, but what we want to focus on is that the average for this machine is 7.8 with a standard deviation of 0.2. Those are the, the key values that we have to pull from that. Now it says, what percent of the lids produced will exceed the 8.4 standard? So effectively, you have a curve here. Right? The curve is centered at 7.8 because that's what we set the machine at. Right, what it's saying is, all right, if 8.4 is right here, what percent of the curve is going to end up shaded in? All right, so we do that using our NCDF. So we're going to do an NCDF from 8.4 to 9999 when the mean is 7.8 and the standard deviation is 0.2. So again, that's our lower bound, that's our upper bound, that's our mean, and that's our standard deviation. All right, so that gives us the values that we need. All right, we then put those into our calculator. So second VARS brings us to the distribution menu, normal CDF, 8.4 to 9.999 with a mean of 7.8 and a standard deviation of 0.2. And that gives us 0 0.0013, uh, we'll say 135, which I am fine leaving your answer like that, but if you wanted to write it as a percent, it would be 0.135%, all right? But I'm okay with you just leaving it right like that. All right, you do not have to go any further with it. Part B, while oversized lids are bad, you also don't want to produce too many undersized lids. The company's fat cat lawyers insist that you're safe as long as no more than 2% of lids exceed the critical value. All right, see US Supreme Court versus Lids USA. To what mean value should the company set the lid machine to achieve this mark? Assume the standard deviation does not change. All right, so what this is saying is, all right, we want the shaded part to be 2%, and we want that to correspond to a value of 8.4. So to make that happen, where does our curve have to be centered? Where's the center of our curve so that when 2% of the curve is shaded, it corresponds to a value of 8.4, and we're trying to find where we have to be centered to make that happen. All right, so we're gonna start by getting this 8.4 as a z-score. So we're gonna do inverse norm of, and even though this is 2%, we're gonna do 0.98, all right, to get the top 2%, because if we just put 0.02 in there, it'll give us the bottom 2%. By putting 0.98, we get the top 2%. And again, the mean is going to be zero and the standard deviation is one because we're finding a z-score. All right, whenever you're finding z-scores, 
the mean is always zero and the standard deviation is one. So this will give us, if we go to our calculator, second distribution, inverse norm, 0.98, zero and one, a z score of 2.0537, we'll say. Right. Now, why does the z-score help us? Because we can use the z-score formula. Right. We know that z equals the actual or the observed minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So our z-score we just found, that's 2.0537. For us, the actual is this number that we don't want to exceed, which is 8.4. The mean is what we're solving for. That's what we don't know. We're trying to find the center of our curve. And the problem told us that the standard deviation stayed the same. So that's gonna be 0.2. Now at this point, it's just running through some algebra. So if I take the 2.0537, and I multiply that by 0.2. So I'm multiplying both sides of my equation by 0.2. All right, that will give me 0.41074. All right, so 0.41074 equals 8.4 minus x. So I'm gonna to have to subtract 8.4 from both sides. That's gonna leave me with a negative x. So I'm gonna divide both sides by negative one. And my final answer, my final answer will be right there, seven point nine eight nine three. We'll say so. X equals seven. Whoops. Seven point nine eight nine three. All right. But again, it's kind of saying, all right, I'm using NCDF to find the percentage of the curve. I'm using inverse norm to find a z-score. And then I'm kind of back solving that to figure out what the mean would have to be, right? And I end up with 7.9839 or 93, all right? And if you want to prove to yourself that that works, you can just go to NCDF and say, all right, now I'm going to do an NCDF from 8.4 to 999 with this new mean that I just calculated and the same standard deviation as always. And you're going to see that that works out to 2%, you know, minus a little rounding, but basically it works out to be 2%. So our approach checks out. We know that it works. All right, let's take a look at number two. The individual scores of students on their final exam are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 75 points and a standard deviation of 15 points. What is the probability that a randomly selected student scores above an 85? All right, so this is another normal CDF question, All right? We've got this curve. It's centered at 75. We want to know, you know, what percent scored an 85 or higher, All right? So that's what we're calculating here is what percent scored an 85 or higher. So that's an NCDF from 85 to 9999 when the mean is 75 and the standard deviation is 15. All right, so again, second VARS, NCDF, 85, 999, the mean is 75, the standard deviation is 15. And we get 0.2525, all right, so. 0.2525, which again, you can leave it like that, or you're welcome to write it as 25.25%. Either one is fine. All right, so that's the first part of this question. Let's flip to the back and look at the second part. If you randomly select three students, what are the mean and standard deviation of the sum of their scores? All right, so this deals with combining random variables. All right, and this is basically saying, what's the expected value of x1 plus x2 plus x3? And what we learned is it's just the expected value of x1 
plus the expected value of x2 plus the expected value of x3. Or in our case, that just means that it's 75 plus 75 plus 75. or 225. Now, the standard deviations are a little more involved, right? Because we can't add the standard deviations, we can add the variances. So what that means is if we're trying to find the standard deviation of x1 plus x2 plus x3, we actually have to combine the variances, and then turn those back into a standard deviation. And the way we do that is we square the standard deviations. So 15 squared plus 15 squared plus 15 squared. And then we take the, st the square root to turn it back into a standard deviation. All right. So again, we can't directly add standard deviation only variances all right so we're adding the variances and then we're taking the square root to turn it back into a standard deviation so i've got 15 squared and i'm just going to multiply that by three because i'm adding it together three times and if i take the square root of that i end up with 25.9808 25.9808. All right, so that would be the expected mean from all three people combined. That's the expected standard deviation from all three people combined. Now, mastery, master, I should probably say mastery, on a regents exam is set at an 85. What is the probability that the three students you selected will have a combined score exceeding 255? So combined. They all exceeded mastery. So again, this is still an NCDF question. So we've got our curve, only the curve has changed. Now, because we're looking at all three at the same time, our curve is centered at 225, and it has a standard deviation of 25. So we're saying, you know, if this is where 255 falls on this curve, what percent is actually shaded. So NCDF from 255 to 9999, when the mean is 225 and the standard deviation is 25.9808. All right, so second VARS, normal CDF, 255, 9999 mean of 225 with a mean of 25.9808. And we end up with 0 0.1241, which again is a perfectly fine answer, but you can also write it as 12.41%. Right. But again, using NCDF to find a percentage, the only difference is we had to find our new mean and our new standard deviation based on what we know about combining random variables. All right, last but not least, this is a data collection question. As a researcher for a pharmaceutical company, you are designing a study to test the effectiveness of a new treatment. You have been given a list of 126 people willing to participate in the trial. The first 70 people are under 40. The remaining 56 are 40 and over. Preliminary research suggests that younger and older people will respond differently to this new treatment. What sort of experimental design would you choose for this study and why? All right, so this goes back to kind of knowing the vocabulary around that unit. But when you have two groups that you expect to react differently, generally for experiments, we use what's called a randomized block, which is basically where we make sure the older and the younger people are balanced. So. If there's 56 over 40, we're gonna make sure that 28 get the treatment and 28 don't get the treatment. Um, if there's 70 people under 40, we're gonna make sure 35 get the treatment and 35 don't. And that guarantees that our groups are balanced and we don't have to worry about our results being 
misleading just because more old people ended up in one group and more young people ended up in the other group. All right, so why are we using randomized block? Um, it helps control for the impact of age on our results. Right. Now again, this is very similar to something called the stratified sample right, that we talked about in this unit. Um, just be aware that a stratified sample is when you're doing surveys and a randomized block is when you're doing experiments. They're the same premise of kind of dividing people up into different groups based on a characteristic. Um, but with an experiment, it's called randomized block. With a survey, it's called a stratified sample. So B says, draw a design for this experiment. Be sure to include a description of how you assign individuals to the treatment groups. All right. So here's what something could look, here's what a write-up could look like. It doesn't have to be exactly this, but this is an example of a, a full and complete write-up. So we could start by saying that we are going to divide the participants into two groups. Old, which is 40 plus, and young, which is less than 40. Then we're going to explain how we divide people up in each group. So we could say, for the young group, generate 35 unique random numbers, all right, so that you're accounting for what happens when you accidentally get the same number twice. So we're saying unique random numbers between 1 and 70. All right. These people will be the control. The other 35 get the treatment. Right. But notice I'm specifying that they're being randomly assigned. I'm specifying that it has to be unique. I'm specifying how many end up in each group. You know, those are the levels of detail that I'm looking for on a question like this. Um, and then for the old group, I can basically say, you know, follow the same procedure. for the old group only there will be just 28 in each group and the numbers go from 1 to 50 and then not 1 to 50, sorry. And the numbers will be running out of room here. 1 through 56. All right. So again, just kind of specifying how exactly I'm going to do this. You know, it's not enough to just say, oh, I'm going to have a young group and an old group, and I'm going to randomly divide them in half and give the control and the other half the treatment. You've got to give me a little more detail of how you're going through the process, how it's breaking down, um, and, and you know the methodology that you come up with to ensure that each person is like randomly assigned. Right? So again, that's an example of a question that could be on the open-ended part of your test. It'll give you some scenario it'll ask you to design some sort of experiment or some sort of data collection process for that scenario. All right, so being familiar with this sort of vocabulary 
and then being familiar with how we manage random assignment. All right. I hope this was helpful. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, best of luck on your exam.